Hi! Welcome to Global Life Skills Day. My name is Jennifer Fullerton and I am here on behalf of my company Breakthrough, which has a parenting game or program, depending on how you use it and utilize it. Um, it's a, a positive reinforcement model. Um, I'll explain how I started with that or how I got into that a little bit. Um, I'm also working with a nonprofit called I Will as well as the original program that got me started oh so long ago, Pathfinders. So we're getting some really exciting stuff um, started and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that with you towards the end of our, our time together. So the first thing I want to do is to define life skills because I personally had a, um, a not necessarily a problem, but um, some family members and um, friends, when they're trying to understand what I do for a living, I, um, you know, they, they want to know what, why is it that you need to help um, advocate for life skills or for, uh, you know, advocate for life skill enhancement for, for people. Um, isn't that just something that we all learn from our families? Yeah, it's true. We all learn that just from our families <laughs> um, and from society, right? But um, but so let's so let's go ahead and define that because I think it's an important thing to start off with. Um, skills, uh, life skills are skills that every human learns in some measure. Okay, so that would be something like communication and stress management, anger management, values, motivation, um, conflict resolution, all life skills. I also like to point out all good that look on a resume. They all will help your employability whoosh, go right up. So, um, so that's life skills. Let's start off with a, a lesson. Okay. It's a, no, when I say lesson, I hope that didn't scare you, but I'd like you to do something for me. Could you put your hands together like this and then just take note of which thumb is over which side. And then I want you to switch it for me. So now the opposite thumb should be over. And just take a minute to take note of how that felt. Does it, uh, did it feel awkward? Does it feel uncomfortable? Um, can you do it easier now that you've done it once? Were you like me and had two fingers together for a while and not even realize it? <laughs> and then look around the room and wonder if you were the only one that had done that and did they see you? Because I do that. <laughs> okay, if you are one of those people, we're, you're in good company. Okay, so we're going to um, follow through with this in a little bit and periodically throughout the talk. So, um, but just, you know, every once in a while, if you think about it, because um, I'm not always fantastic at remembering, you can just go ahead and, and practice this and just, you know, just while you're listening. Okay. All right. So um, the next thing I want to say or talk about is my beginning. So um, my beginning, I, li I was born in Berlin in Germany. My dad was a pilot, so we got to move around a lot. And mostly just ping pong over the lake, as we like to say. So we went to um, back to California and mostly back California and Berlin were the two main um, locations. And um, in 1989, I graduated from high school. I was in Berlin at that time. And I graduated about a half year early and um, went to school at Davis. Now here's the thing. I did not know what I wanted to do. My path was not clearly set at that point. So... Um, I, you know, people, my family would joke. I was on the 10 year plan. Um, and, uh, so it was true. Fortunately for me, I, I got to go back to Berlin when the wall fell and, and dance on the wall to bring the new year in for 1989. That was, um, uh, yeah, that, that event cannot be replaced. And I'm so grateful to have been a part of that and met some amazing people and, uh, learned, uh, learned a lot of, uh, of things about that. I didn't know about Germany and about the people on the other side of the wall. So I was, was, was really happy about that. Interesting little fact, we were asked to bring bananas over when the, when the wall fell, because they, they didn't, you know, either they didn't have them, there weren't enough, but they, they really wanted bananas. As somebody from the, the wives club had, had heard and they were putting them in the, in their, in their lunches because people were flooding over so quickly they were, they needed to make, um, lunches for families so that they had something to eat. So yeah, that was fun. So anyway, let's fast forward. I went back to school um, after that 
And um, again, still didn't know. I, my, my family was, you know, people that cared and loved me and thought, they, you know, they'd have good ideas that matched my personality style and would give me some suggestions. And I'd, I'd move forward with those ideas. But like anything, you know, when it doesn't really fit, it doesn't fit. And so when it fizzled out, it fizzled out hard. <laughs> I ended up getting married instead and moved to Holland. And then I came back to school because I know academics is really important. Um, <laughs> now I know life skills are really important. But I um, didn't know that yet. Still, still yet to come. Fortunate again because I was given the opportunity to move up to Oregon and be part of a program uh, that changed lives. And it was called Pathfinders. And I uh, facilitated that curriculum in three different um, facilities. And uh, I think I probably learned more. It's kind of like reading a good book. You always get a new nugget every time you take it or every time you read it. And it was the same thing with the, with the curriculum. You, know, you learn something different, a little bit different from some responses. Um, from the, from the students. And, and, you know, the cool thing was that, you know, um, with each, with, with each class, they would have, um, just, uh, it, it was because it was a, an experiential based learning kind of, 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 um, curriculum. So you read some, you know, you read some and you discuss what, what you was read and then you'd have some flyers or, or questionnaires to fill out to learn more about your style or learn about how your sugar and salt intake impact your stress. But for the most part, it was a lot of exercises and then doing the rundown of what the exercises meant and what that meant about you and how you manage or how you solve problems or how you, where, what you value, that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea being is that I don't want to tell you what happens when people get angry and make this generalized statement. I want to give you a scenario and then you tell me what would happen, you know, in your, in your situation with your personality type, what would you do? What would your anger look like? So, um, so it was real life learning, real life learning. I mean, it was just really in the moment kind of learning. And so you had to be able to think on your feet, which was good for me because that was a lot of, a lot of versatility and a lot of, um, yeah, engaging conversation. And, um, the other, uh, the other thing that was really interesting is that, you know, that when people would ask me if I felt safe going into prison and kind of thought that that was a crazy move for me. It was just another weird thing that I was, or not weird, but you know, crazy thing I was doing. Like, oh, is that Jen? She's going to go to be an actress and, or not. I, I went as a dramatic art major for a while. So you're going to go do that. And now you're, now you're going into prisons and teaching. That's, that's crazy talk. <laughs> and, um, and the fact was, is that, you know, I knew who the quote unquote bad guys were when I was there. You know, they, they wore denim shirts and denim and they had DOC stamped on the back. It was pretty clear who was there because they committed crime. So, um, on this, you know, in my neighborhood, I no idea, no idea. Even with those nifty little computer things that tell you where all the sex offenders are and if you have a felon living next to you, which, yeah, still, that doesn't really tell you everything, does it? Does it? Because you don't know the ones that aren't on the list or um, haven't committed crime yet or just haven't gotten caught. So, you know, I, I always, I always, it's a, it's a cautionary tale to make sure that you're very aware of, of, of that you're listening to your, your, uh, um, <laughs> your intuition. And so that, you know, you know, when you're listening to your intuition, usually that's the best guide. And, you know, if, if you're one of those people that find that you're in tough situations or you live in a neighborhood that maybe needs more security, you know, do that personal safety and that training and, and, you know, talk, get to know your police department for sure. But, um, but you don't certainly don't want to trust someone down the street just because they're not on the list. Right. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, moving right along the, uh, inmates that I w were walking through my doors would eventually be walking out into the environment from which they came. And I bring that up because that environment from which they came most likely is very similar, if not the same. Um, that family or those the people that are within that environment most likely are still speaking the same, same type of language. And I'm sending this this inmate back home, the student, whatever, the home back home with this whole new skill set. Um, a resume just chock a block full of quality, and so, um, so, and I, I just think I bring that up because I think it's a it's a good 
place to start talking about the environment or the shift in the environment that, or the how we look at things for um, for the future because it is the inmate and it is the family and it is the generations to come and it is our community and society and we we're all in this together. So um, with that being said, one of the inmates that got out. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting. We went to a summit. He, he did a lot of, of talking on behalf of Pathfinders to share all of the of the golden nuggets he had learned. And um, he shared his story and um, come to find out that he had been um, accused of statutory rape. And um, and the fact was, is that he had had consensual sex with his girlfriend. She was underage and he was 19. So by law, they were right. Um, but it ruined his life. And, um, and when he went to go get a job, he did not list, um, that he w was convicted of a felony. And so, um, he did get the job. He worked himself all the way up to upper management. He had a pristine, um, record and a nice red sports car and beautiful girlfriend and things were looking great until of course, they discovered that he had lied on his resume and his application and he was fired and went right back to where he started and um, couldn't make apartment, you know, payments for his home and um, wedding. And it's just, it just all came crumbling down. So um, again, I bring that up because not only do I think we need to share the same language or have the ability to share the same language, but we also need to have some empathy and show some, some movement and um, some room to, to allow people to admit mistakes, pay for their mistakes, and then come back into a society where they're able to support their family or just support themselves, pay their taxes, have their lives. Um, they're going to get out. Let's let them thrive. And um, we certainly don't want them taking up more space in prison because there's no room. Okay, so let's let them let's let them be successful. Um, one of the things that those that those students would say to me when we were in class was, you know, without fail, every single class actually, um, why didn't we learn these lessons sooner? And that's I think a great question. I mean, it's what I'm asking now. So why don't we learn them sooner? Well, my, my company was really smart and they said, okay, let's learn them sooner then. So we started, they started doing some research and I, they put me in charge of a pilot project at, um, at a high school and a family resource center. And I got to work with a fantastic guy who I'll be working with soon again. And, um, and we implemented the Pathfinder curriculum there as well. Now here's the cool thing that happened at the school. There was, uh, it was a lot of the, the students were um, truant. They weren't going to all their classes. So it was cool when, you know, I'd find out that some of the kids hadn't gone to other classes, but they were showing up for Pathfinder. So that was awesome. Loved that. I also loved that the kids that would sit in the back of the classroom and just kind of, for lack of a better term, mope about not wanting to be in school at all and would rather just be at home. Um, they ended up starting to sit in the beginning in the in the middle I mean in the front of the class and then they were engaging with me about why they weren't turning in homework because I Pathfinders didn't have any homework. We did everything and we discussed everything together. So um so those those people that were super duper quiet in the very beginning, almost you know, brewing in the back, were now engaging in conversation and sharing some really important things that were impor very important to them, so then therefore important to me as well. Um, and so, you know, because that wasn't my, my role of being there, of course, we, we would find the right direction for them to go and, um, have to have some faith in that. Um, but I think that that's again, um, about being able to communicate and, and speak in those same languages because it is just this huge group effort. Um, if we're looking at family generation, <laughs> children, teens, one of the, um, one of the things I recently read uh, was from uh, the UNODC, which is the um, United Nations Office on uh, Drugs and Crime. 
And one of the, they, what they said, first of all, is that they recognize that youth of today worldwide is um, overrepresented as both victim and perpetrator. So that, um, yeah. And then the second thing that they recognize is that life skill enhancement or life skill training been, it would it helps them and supports them in becoming more resilient against acts of violence, um, as well as being more more available for the deterrence um, set up to help them, you know, to avoid um, criminal acts. With specifics, they mention critical thinking as those life skills. Just to be clear, so. Um, I love that the, you know, the United Nations is this department, you know, sees that whole picture and understands the value and sees, you know, that we can start, we can start earlier on and, and prevent people from ever even having to enter behind those bars. And then, um, and then getting everyone to be able to speak that again, that same language. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but I just think it's so important. You know, it's like going to a foreign country and you don't know how to speak the language, you're, you're going to, you don't use it, you'll lose it. And I, I spent too much time and too much care, you know, working with these people to learn these skills. They got to, they have to be able to have the avenue and the, the means to be able to use them um, in the society for which they are built. Um, I'd also like to point out that in this society from which they are built, um, we're continuously learning. Like I had mentioned earlier, I was learning from them and, you know, I'm learning from the security. I'm learning from the prison system, from, you know, how to manage a classroom, how to manage a classroom of inmates. I mean, you know, if they come over and they ask you, you know, to bring over, you know, can you, do you mind bringing in some cigarettes? We're not allowed. It, no, can't. That's against the law um, because of. Well, a lot of rules in prisons are actually created because of um, lawsuits that are brought against the prison, against the Department of Corrections from inmates. So, peop, uh, inmates were suing the Department of Corrections for secondhand smoke, and so they said, "Okay, no smoking." <laughs> so they kind of, you know, would try could could they didn't actually I never fell for that trick, but. Um, they could potentially come up and, and you know try to smoke. Oh, you look really great today. You're fantastic. You want to bring me in some smokes? And I'd be thinking I'd be doing them a favor. Anyway, so constant, constant learning, and um, and it was all this you know big team effort to make sure that that I didn't fall into the trap. And that was in great part because of the security that was there and doing their job, and then um, and then me providing the skill set that I had. To um, to do my job, and the other um, the uh, you know when when people used to ask me if I was nervous about being in prison, I was you know not you know, again the, the 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 DOC on their on the back of the shirt, and I know who they are, and the security is there to protect me, so we're golden. If they were out of hand, then you know, just flag down a security, and and they would end up having to to spend some time where they didn't want to, and and. Uh, but one time there was an incident when um, the there was a lockdown and one uh, co-facilitator actually got stuck on some stairs and the a big swarm of inmates that had not taken pathfinders were rushing up and not necessarily for her um, by any stretch but but definitely it could have been a very scary situation and what she found is that she was like, pressing against the wall when she turned around her group of pathfinders had formed a circle around her, um, in protection to make sure that nobody touched her. So, um, you know, we were there helping, helping people, um, with their lives. And so, you know, they, and they gave back in return. So, um, so when, uh, when they, when the inmates would say, you know, why didn't we learn these sooner? My company listened. So we, we opened up that, so we did the, um, resource center, the pilot project. We also opened up an alternative school for teen moms. And, um, that was the result of the, all of the, the pilots and the studies that we were doing. And, and they were, uh, amazing. 
I love those girls. And they bring in their girls, their kids, and they and then we would help them find daycare and find utilize the resources. I mean, that's what's always amazing to me is that there's so many resources out there that people don't know how to utilize. So, um, so being able to help the teens that you know they're they were too young to have children in the first place, but certainly, um, you know, some of the things that they were having to learn as far as you know financial aid or or uh, food stamps, child care, child support, that kind of thing. You know, there's it was a lot of a lot of information and a um, big learning curve. So, so we got so we did that. Um, it was a different curriculum when you're teaching teen girls communication, as I'm sure you can imagine, stress management. Um, one of the one of the stories I wanted to share with you is uh, one of the girls that was she was turning 19, so she almost aged out of the program, but we we needed to make sure she got that GED. And um, she had four children. At the time, she had three, and she was pregnant with her fourth. Crazy. I, I can't imagine having one at 19, let alone four. But um, she, it was so cool because we'd been working with uh, her anger management, and, and she, she and I had had quite a few conversations. And she came running into me one day through the door and said, Jen, Jen, you have to hear it. What, look what happened. I'm so awesome. <laughs> and I was like, well, what happened, huh? And um, so she she had seen her baby's daddy's new girlfriend and was across the street. She said, you have no idea how much I wanted to just kick her butt. That's not how she put it for the record. And um, and uh, I, I'm like, yeah, I get it. I mean, this gal, this um, teen mom, had, definitely she came from um, a more difficult neighborhood and I know that some of her family were in gangs and um, she's definitely prone to violence that she'd been in trouble for that and in fact that's probably well I know that that's part of what her her record is so um, part of her story I should say so I'm like well what did you do like it looks like you're you know you're smiling what's happening and she said well I just I saw her and I just started jumping up and down and saying pathfinders 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 and I was just blown away because, well, first of all, that's not an exercise in Pathfinders to jump and yell it. Um, but what she did do was she did a thought stopper and she re redirected her energy. And that's just so huge for her to look at what her values were, what her goals are, what she wants. And knowing that kicking that girl's tail would not get her anywhere close to where she wants to be. That was phenomenal. I was so proud of her. So, um, so it's just like, you know, this is one of those paths that just keep on giving. So guess what I did? I found my path. Hello. <laughs> I didn't need college for that. Oh yeah, I did. I do. So I had to say goodbye to Oregon. <laughs> I had to go back down to UC Davis and finish my degree because I, you know, when you find your calling and you know what you want to do when you grow up. <laughs> You need to make sure you've got all the tools, right? So I am, um, so I went back to school and um, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. So um, I went back to school. I finished in no time flat, by the way. When you do find your path and it's smooth, you it's a lot easier to get through school. Who knew? Not a 10-year path. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. I, um, they, they thought I would, it would take about two and a half years to, to finish was the estimate. And I was really depressed about it since it had already been so long, but, um, but I finished in a year and a summer and was just done. Cause I, it, with, and it was, I have to say that it was pretty darn easy because I, because I had found what I needed to know. And, and I was just, it was like being a kid again and just a sponge and just collecting all that information. It was awesome. So, um, so once I graduated, um, I did the dance of joy, of course, and then I had to find more, um, ways in order to give back to the people that I wanted to serve. And so I did, I found, I was a, a counselor at a alcohol and drug clinic. I, um, worked for a residential treatment center for at-risk youth, for the teen girls. Um, I worked on the girls campus and both, both of these programs allowed me to bring in the curriculum um, and a lot some of the lessons that I'd been using um, in Oregon, um, but you know the really cool thing about um, Pathfinders was their ability to track 
um, their tracking system to be able to see the success rate. I mean, they had a reduction in recidivism with high risk offenders of 80%, 80%. And the only reason that they could show the Department of Corrections that was because of their tracking. So, uh, you know, being able to see that success is always motivational for what well, was motivational for me to, to continue on, you know, can we make 85? <laughs> so, um, but, but these programs were, you know, I wasn't part of that, um, department that would do that. So it's very, it, it's possible that they did it as well. But, um, I think that that's, uh, uh, it's, I think it's important, especially with something like life skills that doesn't always, you know, it seems to get the, the, the cutting floor, you know, when, when you're making a movie and they, it's like the, one of the things that go in schools, you know, you have home economics goes, woodshop goes, band goes, in order to make room for the academics because they're running out of money. So, you know, what I'm asking for is reallocation of money, get some more money where it's going to help keep kids in school. Because that's one of the big things when we're looking at teenagers and we're looking at these teens that are coming from these families that are prone to potentially, you know, having maybe it's violence, you know, that, um, that they're in within families that, have in, have uh, family members that are going into prison, so they don't have as much um, structure, as much parenting. Then um, they're more likely to be in a scenario where they're going to drop out, unless they have the life skills training to be able to help them figure out what their goals are, what their values are, what they want in life, how to communicate, how to communicate what's going on at home. You know, if they need help at home. There's so many different areas that we can look at that can show how having this arena, you know, this area for them to be able to communicate with helps with their family, with their future, with, again, generations to come. So um, if you have, if we really change the, have a, just a whole shift in the environment, a whole shift as, as how we see this, um, we have potential, if, if, if all these scenarios were in the, in the equation, in the recipe, then we'd have inmate coming home. We'd have family members, um, having access to the same type of information on an online course, for example. Um, perhaps it's part of their parole or probation. Um, what if the teen is, uh, yeah, they're in, they're enrolled in their, they are there, they're at high school and they have their, um, their life skills class first period, right? Um, but let's say they, they slip and they get violent and I get it in today's there, we have, we really don't have very much tolerance for any kind of, you know, bringing, bringing a knife to school, for example, bad idea. Um, <laughs> if you're, um, if you're in that, uh, mindset and you're thinking that's how you get attention, um, that it's going to get you in trouble and it's not necessarily what you're intending or wanting. So having some lessons in being able to communicate better or having even an advocate to be able to communicate with you so that you can support yourself, um, is important. Now, um, with that, I want to point out that I think that, that it's the communities and the society's responsibility to help keep these kids in school. Um, even the ones that, um, you know, bring something to school that they shouldn't, even the ones that, uh, are violent and they, they need some support. I'm not saying to blindly allow these kids to stay in school. They need support, whether it's counseling, whether it's some time off to get the counseling that they need to be able to get the education, or maybe it's getting some of that education that's at home and that's going to cost, you know, some additional funds. We can't just pass them off though and say, you know, we're done with you. It's kind of like when I, on the phone with the phone company and they call and they, <laughs> I call them for help and they say, oh, it's not us. It's your bank. And I call the bank and they say, it's not us. It's your phone company. Bank. Phone company. You get the picture? And they just, they pass you back and forth saying that it's somebody else's problem. And the fact is, is that these kids are, uh, well, they're ours, right? They're, and I know that there's some of them have problems, but it's our, it's our responsibility to help. Um, and so we can't just pass them on to another school um, that, um, that might not be able to help as well.
right? And just like we're just washing our hands. So that is that part. Um, now, why why is it why is it that I'm bringing this to you? So, um, can we put, we need to push a pause button because I I did it. Remember when I said I was gonna forget? So if you could do this for me, I would appreciate it. Sitting here, I was thinking about something and I thought I'm forgetting something. Okay, so if you just do this a little bit and just take note, is it feeling a little different? Does it feel a little awkward? So moving right along. Um, so the reason that I'm asking you is because we do have that responsibility to take care of those kids, each and every one of them, your neighbors, yours, I'll take care of yours, you take care of mine. We got it. What? Oh, I can't do it. I was going to repeat. I was going to repeat a first lady. I'm not going to do it, but it's, but it's all of our responsibility. And, um, and if it will responsibility privilege to be part of this world, and um, its experience, this human experience that we're in, and um, and paying it forward is super important, and um, giving back super important. So, um, if you are able to uh, contribute, you might ask, like, well, what can I do to contribute? Is what I'm trying to get to. Um, so, what you can do is you can do something as simple as like this video. You can comment on this video. You can ask questions. I uh, can't believe that you forgot us to cross our hands, Jen. What were you thinking? You know, just make write a note in the in the comment section. Um, that would be doing something. Just continuing this conversation and just recognizing maybe maybe you disagree with something I said. By all means, I love to have conversations about, especially when when someone's coming forth with some valid points, so that I can think about. What that means, how does that, does that change my opinion? Does that change how I'm thinking about it? Because this is all of our classroom. This mandatory classroom we're in, we're in it for the long haul, you know, until, until that final moment when we're, we're, we transition to the next phase. This is it. So we've got to continue learning. We have uh, COVID. <laughs> that was a big learning curve. And now we're in that process where we're having to, you know, if anybody else, I, I had three teenage boys that went through COVID. Anybody else? You know what happens when you have three teenage boys that stay home and have more time with their computer than you would have wanted originally and had ever planned. So that, um, that was a big learning curve. Lots of conversations happened there. And, and when you have three teen boys that are coming of age at home for two years, and with nothing more than a computer. Um, let's just say that there's a lot of conversations that happen with schools too, because see, they didn't get the social structuring that would normally happen. They didn't get the, the disapprovals from the neighbor and the, the lady at the, on this, you know, at the store and that we all got as part of our, as part of our learning curve. You know, when we, when we stepped over a line, there was always somebody there that went, you know, <laughs> get back in line. So, they didn't they could x out of a screen so um so now i'm talking to the their counselors and their teachers and their principals and finding out that it is a very common problem and um, we need to be part of that conversation so that's what this is about that's what this kind of conversation is about is is recognizing that those are all life skills those are things that now they're deficient in some life skills that we had learned it might end up being that the means in which they're learning these end up being better. Um, you know, now my, one of my sons has a girlfriend that lives across the country. I bet they're not going to be adding to the teen pregnancy rate. <laughs> I mean, they still need to learn about sex education. They still need to have all these other lessons, but they're learning how to communicate and talk and, you know, all those things that, that we learned about relationships. There's, there's certain aspects of it that could be potentially positive. I haven't given you know, all those pieces as much thought as I would like to actually, um, you know, before I made a firm statement, but that's just one of those things that just whoop, went through my mind. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can write a letter to your congressman. Um, you can call the, the school board and say that you want life skills in your, in your school. 
Um, and you can write an email. Um, at the end, we'll be um, I'll be putting up the website and the um, that you can sign up for a newsletter, the email, phone number. You can call and communicate with us at any time and find out where we're at. Um, maybe you want to help and, and donate some time. I'll find something for you to do. So um, there's that. What is the what is Pathfinders and I will and and uh, breakthrough doing together? Um, a lot of what I was just discussing. So we're looking at which curriculum can get digital so that it can be available online so that when a mom and dad come home from prison that the same language is being spoken. Um, access to resources, networking, um, different types of learning. So you've got learning that's really conducive to being in prison, hands-on, like actively learning. There's other types of learning that is more shared with through your story. I know that I uh, I worked with the Pathfinder curriculum before I even stepped foot in a prison. I I started looking at how to rewrite it for uh, for youth um, in in elementary school levels, and when I did that, it you know I I learned a lot. I really did. Nothing compared to when I was teaching it. Not even close. Like I said, I there was one lesson that I had to call the the author and say, <laughs> "What's the answer?" Yeah, because I didn't, you know, I, it, that's just how, how we work, right? So, um, so there's that. And then I feel like I'm missing something, but, um, but the important, the important part is that, that we're one, starting the conversation, two, inviting you to join, um, and then continuing, continuing to recognize that change is inevitable. It's, it's here. We need to be willing to be flexible and move with them, them being all the changes, um, because, because nobody knows everything. It's not gonna, it's not possible. Sorry. Okay. Um, the final thing, we are at our close. Yay! Here we go. So the hand thing. Now consider this a habit. I want you to consider this a habit, okay? So when I when I do this, this was a habit for me to always put my right thumb over my left. It actually has more to do with your makeup, right? These right-handed people, you know, that I, I've heard that. But I'm just talking about if you consider this to be like a habit, right thumb over. Um, breaking that habit is uncomfortable. It feels strange. And I also wanted to see if other people in the very beginning were breaking the habit in the same way as I was. Are you as uncomfortable in that room that I was in that first time? I just did it again. I did that. Yeah. Um, but the, um, but change is inevitable. And when I, when I do this now, it's almost second eight. I'm a professional <laughs> hand switcher. My parents would be so proud. Um, but I, but I can do that, you know, and it doesn't feel as, as strange and it feels more natural. And, um, even though it's still reminiscent of being different than what was intended or what I had originally done my whole life, um, I can still feel that. Um, and I certainly, if nobody's talking to me about this exercise, it's exactly what I do. I'll go back to that every day of the week. But, um, but it's with intention that you make those changes. So, living life with attention. Go get them. Go get them. Go get them, cowboy. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Global Life Skills Day. I'm glad you're here. And I look forward to next year. Okay. Bye-bye.